morning. If you'd like, you can go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 4, and we'll begin there this morning. John chapter 4. So I want to, I just want to thank Mr. Greg and, and all the elders here and all the members. Uh, y'all have all been just so, so incredibly kind to me and, um, and by the process of getting to know everybody and as the summer's beginning and, um, and the spring into the summer, um, y'all have just been just incredibly kind and I'm, I'm very thankful uh, to be a part of this, this church family uh, for this summer and to get to know every single one of you here, so, or at least try to, at least. And I want to first say that I acknowledge that it's a huge responsibility to present the Word of God to all of you here, um, and I appreciate your presence here today. And if there's anything that I say that's not in line with the Scriptures and what we're going to look at today, I, I pray that you just let me know, and I'd love to talk about it with you, because I'm trying to learn more about the Bible, as um, we all are. And so I would really appreciate that. Thank you for being here today. So I, I want you if, you, if you can, to picture in your mind, picture in your mind a desert, and what, what, that, what that is like. Um, in your mind, what, what a desert is. Um, and think, you might think of a desolate place, um, a very dry, dry place, not much vegeta vegetation can grow, uh, many diverse animals. It's a, it's a really unique environment, um, the desert is. So think of that. What comes to mind when you, when you picture a desert? Um, there's, a, there's a lack of water. Um, oftentimes you become incredibly dehydrated with how just dry and desolate the desert is. And when you think of that, the mind might go to a type of physical thirst. No, you, you probably would not be thinking of, of spiritual thirst and that longing inside of you. So as we carry that thought um, of being in the desert, when we look at Exodus 15 and 22 and 27, we see a, a picture of the Israelites uh, wandering through the wilderness. They're crying aloud to God. They don't have any water uh, or food. And they keep asking Moses, and they keep pleading, you know, you brought us out here to die. Um, they, they, they believe that Moses has brought them out to this wilderness as they're trying to head to the promised land. And, and they're convinced that he's just bringing them out there to kill them. And, uh, but God, we see that God provides the Israelites with water. And you might maybe thinking, why am, I, why am I talking about this and the significance by this? Well, God provides them with physical water. And throughout this lesson, we're going to talk about what other water God provides us with. Before we get into the, the answer um, and how we can come in contact with this water of life, we're going to look at a few problems. Um, and I want to present for you three problems as Christians and as unbelievers uh, living in this world today. So the first one to look at is the dissatisfaction that we have as humans. Genesis 3, verse 5, through the, in the very beginning, we see that Adam and Eve, they have everything that they can, that they can have to, um, that can be offered to a human. God has them in paradise with them, in relationship with, them, with him, and walking with him. And we see that uh, Adam and Eve come into contact with the devil and a serpent. And, and God only asks one command. He just says, do not eat of the fruit of this tree. And the devil exploits his command and says that it's okay to eat of this fruit because you'll be, become like God. And the problem with that is... The problem with that is uh, they forgot that they were already made in the image of God as we have, as we have seen. So we see that Adam and Eve are, are dissatisfied and longing for more when they already have everything that they need there with them. Deuteronomy 29, verses 26, we see this problem persist. 
the Israelites are wandering throughout the wilderness, and we see them as a pattern that they go from worshiping God and serving Him, praising Him, and then they turn to all these false idols, false gods. In Romans 7, verse 19, we read where Paul says, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I believe that is, that is very true of us as Christians today. We, we strive to do the right thing and what is good and what in our hearts we know is best. Yet we still get pulled away from that water of life and from what we know is best for us and what will save us and deliver us. And we see the Israelites do this in Adam and Eve, do that in the beginning. The second problem is that the world appears to have everything to offer. We already saw where the devil uh, tricked Adam and Eve and told them, showed them that uh, there's more that they need. Our attention is pulled to earthly affairs. Techno there's so many technological advancements. We see there's a, there's a new iPhone coming out. Got to have the new iPhone. A uh, new car, got to have the new Tesla, whatever the, the next best thing. And along with this is materialism in the modern culture. Um, social media is a big problem. Um, I know with kids my age, um, we get so caught up in um, who has the best um, Instagram page or whatever it may be. Today we are, we are very focused on what the world has to offer to us. The third problem um, we look at is pridefulness. It's one of the most common, common problems, and it's one of the devil's favorite weapons. Pride can become come between God and us. It's often one of the, the main reasons why we're separated from God, because us as humans, we have, we're naturally and historically selfish, and we feel that we're greater than God sometimes, or we feel that we can, we can do it ourselves. Um, and it's, it's hits far too home, I know, with me and many, many people. The devil was cast out of heaven for this reason. The devil was seeking power on his own, and he was prideful. And as we already mentioned, humans have been historically selfish. It is a big problem, and we, we need to keep this in check with us, when our, with ourselves, when it comes to our relationship with God. It, it is so easy to, to let that come between us and God and separate us. One of our, one of our last problems that we're going to look at before we get into looking at the solution, what, what can we do to to um, find what needs to deliver us and some answers, solutions to this. And then the next problem is seeking approval from others. Another one that's far too common with people my age and that I, that I struggle with sometimes, it ultimately leads to disappointment. You know, when you're, when you're constantly trying to, to appease others and to please those around you, to impress them and be somebody that you're not, you're ultimately going to be disappointed. You're ultimately going to be disappointed because no matter how much praise they give you or how much validation they give you, it's never going to be enough. So that is why it's an, it's an endless rat race. You see this in, in business, uh, people trying to have the best business, st staking everything on this, this pursuit. It's almost as if they, if they put their whole life uh, focus into this and invest everything into this, and yet they realize when it collapses, they have nothing else to fall on. They, they do not have a solid foundation. And we, we know that song that um, the wise man built, <laughs> I was about to sing it, the wise man built his house upon the rock. And it's, it's true, it's very true. Paul writes in Galatians 1 verse 10, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So this is a, a very convicting verse here. And it's, 
is most definitely something that we, we have to ask ourselves consistently. Um, it's one of the verses that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds um, of the many verses in the Bible. Um, it is it's very convicting, as Paul writes in the end of it, that we would not be a servant of Christ if we were still trying to please man after becoming Christians. So after looking at, at a few problems that we might have and uh, that takes us away from, from this water of life, we're going to explore what is the water of life and what, what is the answer uh, to all of these problems that we deal with as humans that are all too true and, and that we, we fall prey to so often. So we're, our main passage we're going to look at is, is John chapter 4. And if you're there, uh, that's where we're going to uh, look at and spend a little bit of time here. So in John chapter 4, uh, we see Jesus and the woman of Samaria here. Jesus and his disciples, are, they have just kicked off their ministry. And he's, him and his disciples have been going from town to town. And, and they arrive close to Samaria. And um, Jesus and is, is very tired and very weary. And he, he arrives at Jacob's well and he sits down and he, and as you can imagine, he's probably very thirsty as he asks the Samaritan woman to uh, give him a drink of water. The woman of Samaria is, is carrying a, a yoke of water. She's, she's filling up her water at Jacob's well and uh, in the heat of the day. And now to clarify, the uh, Samarians and the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. They did not see eye to eye. The uh, Samarians were considered half-bloods with the Jews. The Jews did not did not like the Samarians. So it was almost a almost a crazy uh, scene as to why why is Jesus talking to this woman of Samaria? It was it was seen as a disgrace almost as they were both uh, uh, despised each other. So we see that Jesus takes time to speak to an outcast. And I, and I believe it's important to note, it's important to note that, um, that this woman, she, she's walking and bringing her water to the well at the heat of the day. You know, when, when many, many women there, it was common for the women to be getting the water from the well. And it's important to note that she's going there in the heat of the day, when most people would not want to be going to get the water. You know, we try to cut grass during the, the uh, coolest part of the day. Um, you don't want to cut grass at 3 o'clock or you're going to be, you're going to be pretty scorched. Um, so we see that he takes the time to speak to an outcast. Both Jesus and the woman are tired and weary. In verse 13 and 14, well, after Jesus asked her to give her, him a drink of water, and Jesus is doing this to, to uh, reveal to the woman that he is the Messiah. And on verse 13 and 14, we read, Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then we read, the, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So, so Jesus takes this, this physical water and he, he, then he talks to the woman and, and he, he tells her, the water that I will give you, you will never be thirsty again. And you, if you think about this and put yourself in the woman's shoes, you think, what, what is this guy talking about? He's talking about this other type of water. But we see she, she asks him, and she, she wants this water. She wants to know what this water is that will save her and bring her to eternal life. And, and it's, it's important to note that, that Jesus, Jesus sought her out, this outcast of a woman, this Samaritan woman. It shows the love of Jesus and how we should be, not having grudges against against another a person of another race, um, whatever it may be, let love be genuine as the theme of the church 
uh, this year is. We see that Jesus comes to her that she, so, so that she can come to him. It's important, it's important to note this. He brings up matters of salvation to her because, because he cared for her and her soul. It was his whole mission. It was God's whole mission all along to, to seek us out and to come to us so that we may be saved and to bring us back to him. We see in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we see that Jesus says, you know, Come to me, and I, and I will give you rest. Oftentimes we forget this and, and we, we carry the world on our shoulders. As this, this woman was doing, carrying the yoke of water on her shoulders. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. And now there's, there's two yokes, as, uh, as much as I know, as far as I know, that two yokes, one with the water that the lady was carrying to the well, and the other that that oxen would carry um, themselves. It would be two oxen, and one would carry one, one side of the yoke, the other the other side. And Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus is saying, if you, if you take up my yoke, it is easy, and the burden is light. You know, take the burden off of your shoulders and give it to me. Jesus is saying, give it to me. And I heard somebody say once with, with the yoke analogy as well, with what Jesus is saying here, uh, with the oxen. You know, sometimes we, sometimes we like to, to take that yoke and to, to push a little bit more and carry more and not allow Jesus to take some of that load. A lot of the time we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves and, and not letting Jesus carry his load as well. He's already carried uh, this heavy load for us. And we just need to let him. Here's a picture of, of what it might have looked like uh, for the women carrying the buckets. And I, I'm not, I don't think they would have had metal buckets at, at, the, <laughs> at this time and uh, during Jesus' time. And our second to last point is faith in Jesus. After we come to Jesus, we, we, we place our faith in him. As a result, we will we'll never thirst again. This doesn't mean that we'll never grow thirsty again. I know when I ran cross country in, in high school and in the summer we would run and man, it would, it would get hot as blazes out there, man. We would, I would never wanted water more in my life. Um, you get so hot and dehydrated um, and that water, when you taste it, man, it, it tastes so good. It tastes so good. It's the same with Jesus. Uh, we talked about the, in the desert feeling uh, dehydrated, the, how dry it is. You know, so many people in the world, and we know as Christians, most Christians here, we, we know that we felt this way. Inside of us, there's a, there's a drought and a longing for more. And so many people out in the world feel this way as well. They have this drought inside of them. And Jesus, Jesus says, you know, I have this water that I can give you, and you will never thirst again. Not physically, spiritually. And it's our responsibility to take that to these people out in the world. Just as Jesus did. And through Jesus' death, life is given. John 14, verse 27. It reads, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. Yeah, it's going to be the last time I do that. <laughs> when Jesus is speaking, um, before he's, he's about to leave the world and be delivered up to be crucified, he's telling his disciples, giving them his peace. 
He's saying, you know, I, I'm not going to be around much longer, but you, you will have my peace. But it, it, it takes us to, it takes us to trust in him and to let him have his way with us. And then it goes back to the problem. We have to let that pride uh, get out of the way and to let him take us over and let him guide us. And then our final point, after, after this verse, in John 6, verse 35, it says, Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. That is, that is our main verse uh, of this morning. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And our final, final point this morning, obedience to Jesus after placing our faith in him. Many of us here are Christians, though there may be some that are not here and some listening. It takes repentance and baptism, acknowledging that we, have, we are sinners and that we need forgiveness and that we have messed up and we are in need of repair. And baptism, after acknowledging that and placing our faith in Jesus, acknowledging and confessing he's the son of God, to go down the waters of baptism, as Peter told Peter told the, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 37, that the people were asking, you know, what, what, what shall we do? Some of these people might have even been the, been the people who, who delivered up Jesus to be crucified and yelled, you know, crucify him, crucify him. And they asked, well, what shall we do? What shall we do to be saved? And, and Peter tells them, in the first, first sermon ever recorded, you know, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of our sins. And as Jesus tells us, we'll have rivers of water well up from us so that we may give others hope and to share with others the, the hope that we have after being saved and forgiven through the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as the reward we will have is eternal life. And it is our goal as Christians to, to give that to others, that same hope that we have. So as we, we close, I just want to keep in mind that God rescued the Israelites uh, from the wilderness. And he does the same for us here today, spiritually. He does the same for us here today, spiritually. God's grace and his mercy and his spirit, it gives us the ability to provide others with that same water and for the rivers of life to flow through us and to others as well. So in closing, I hope that you've uh, taken, been able to take something away from this lesson today and, and I pray that Wherever your relationship is with Jesus right now, I, I pray that you can realize that he wants you to come to him and that everything is, is going to be okay. And for those of us who, who trust in him, we'll, we'll never thirst again. And he will we'll find rest for our souls. And I pray that we can share that same hope with others and that we can come to the, to the cross to find hope there. Thank you for being such good listeners. I hope you all have a good rest of the week.